Many cousins in Grenada, Trinidad, and the USA, including Christiana Wilkinson and Randolph Edwards. Other relatives and friends, including the Batiste family, including Eunice Batiste, the Bruno family, including Dorothy Bruno, the Dakota family, the Alexanders, including Anthony and Keith, the Celestines, pastors and members of the People's Church St. Paul's, and the entire Pentecostal Assemblies of the West Indies denomination, and neighbors and friends of St. Paul's, Mardi Gras, Pedmota, Mondelez, and surrounding areas. The celebration of flag service for the late Violet Elizabeth Alexander, née Mac, of St. Paul St. George, will take place on Tuesday, 19th April at 1 p.m. Service will be held at the People's Church St. Paul St. George, and interment will be at the Mount Airy Cemetery. Funeral arrangements entrusted to Bailey's Funeral Home. Lucille Elizabeth Alexander, née Mann, of St. Paul St. George, died on Monday, April 4, 2022, at the age of 90. She was the mother of Roy, George, Alfred, and Afro Alexander, Claudia Samuel, and Carol Antoine. Grandmother of 13, Marcia Antoine Beckford in Jamaica, Andre, Ian, Emmanuel, Keenan, and Irma Alexander, Denise Cogan, Cynthia Brulon, Helena Graves, so given the importance of time, ensure that you do not go beyond, beyond one minute so that others will have an opportunity to present their tribute. So you can go right ahead from this mic if you want to go, whoever wants to go first. And um, in the meantime, those, the rest of you, can the, the viewing of the body is open. So. You can come right up and participate in the viewing. Again, for those of you who are just coming in, um, the microphone here is open for one minute tributes. So if you would like to um, present a tribute, sing a song, this is your opportunity to do so. 
um, at this microphone right here to my left. I'm living close to Jesus on Glory Avenue. We walk and talk together as other neighbors do. We have such sweet communion of fellowship. I'm glad I live beside him on Glory Avenue. Jesus is my neighbor, the dearest friend of all. He stays so close beside me. He hears me when I call. Never. 
I'm glad I live beside him on glory avenue. Thank you I'm very glad much. I live beside him on glory avenue. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Again, we are open to, this is a time of open tributes. Uh, just a one minute, please keep it to one minute, please, uh, so that others can have an opportunity. Um, if you would like to come up and um, present one of your tributes, please come to the microphone, right here to my left and to your right. Good afternoon. I'm Sister Shirley James, and that's my church I grew up with. I'm from the country, and since I came from the country, and I came to this church, I met Sister Alexander as a mature Christian person, and she was a real lovely lady to look at as a young person, and I really enjoyed her coming to the church and looking at her as, as, a, as a mature Christian. She was a very loving lady. And I see as I heard her death, I really have to come and give my sympathy to her children. I know many of the children, and I really thank God for her. And may the Lord bless her and keep her. And I know that she are in the hands of the Lord. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adiv Alexander. Ivor. I think I, I, I met uh, many of uh, Mrs. Alexander's children even before I knew her. Um, Ivor and I sat together at Teachers College years ago, and uh, he was a mathematician. Um, but just one story about Ivor. Um, while we were at college, the, the tutor will I would put up mathematical problems on the board for us to solve. But that was a problem because the tutor himself was unable to solve many of those problems that he placed on the board. But luckily, Ivor always came to the rescue and solved those problems for us. Um, good afternoon again. Um, on behalf of uh, my wife, Veronica, who is the niece of uh, Ms. Alexander, uh, we want to offer condolences. Um, I first met Miss Alexander in 1995, uh, just before uh, Veron and I got married. Um, of course, we lived at her place for a number of years. And um, I'm not sure if it was because of the surname Alexander or because of Veronica, but Miss Alexander treated me as though I was one of her son. In fact, just one week before she died, Someone called me and told me, um, you know, they would like to go in touch with my mother. So I, I was a bit confused because I knew my mom had died many years ago. And he said, so I said, well, who are you speaking about? She said, Mrs. Alexander. I said, okay, I understand. In fact, even uh, Mr. Ralph, I almost got in trouble with the law many years ago because one of the law enforcement officers thought and told me, that Mr. Ralph is your father. Of course, I reported him to one of the, the top brass in the police force, and they had to rebuke him. Um, so, but indeed, um, knowing Mr. Alexander was a, a joy, a pleasure. Uh, she was a very bold person, spoke and said what she had to say. Uh, we had many interesting conversations about gardening, about politics, about religion, in fact, one day I went to her home and she asked me, so what do you think about Brexit? In my mind, I said, but what does Mr. Alexander know about Brexit? So I had to, of course, chat with her and explain, you know, what was Brexit. But she knew. She knew. She just wanted, I guess, probably someone else's opinion about Brexit. So she was informed. She knew what was happening. Um, Many a day she came to my rescue and fed me when everyone was out for a while. 
Um, and so, so that was good. So again, uh, knowing Miss Alexander um, was very good memories, fond memories, and indeed, in fact, the, the day that she passed, I was scrolling through some old photos I had of her that morning. And then a couple hours later, you know, we got the sudden. So again, my condolences to Carol and to every one of you, um, Roy, Ivor, George, the in-laws, Freddie, everybody. And, um, but God is good. God is good. Amen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words. And uh, just as a reminder, as you come in, um, it's this encouraged for you to wear a mask. Of course, when you are speaking, you, of course, you can lower your mask. And uh, so, and remember, this is being streamed live online also. So just for your information. So again, we just have about three more minutes for the um, open tribute. So Gordon, I know you are sitting there waiting to go. So if you'd like to come up at this time, thank you. Afternoon, church. There's an open song. It is sending out to everybody. Jesus Christ today, the Savior yesterday, the one, the only way, the King for me. Let it come to pass, mankind find love at last, just as it was to pass, so let it be. No matter if you're sick, or if you dread, or if you have a crown on your head, no matter if you have no heart at all, Jesus bring love for one and all. Sing it, children, I for Jesus, you for Jesus. All for Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Jesus come for one, he comes for all. Sing it, children, I for Jesus, you for Jesus, all for Jesus. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Jesus come for one, he comes for all. Jesus come for one, he comes for all. Jesus come for one, he comes for all. Thank you. Bye, Mom. Thank you, Gordon. That was beautiful. And, uh, you know, that's where mom's heart was, you know, with Jesus. So at this time, um, let's, uh, okay, we'll just have the final yeah. um, one-minute tribute. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, good afternoon to all. I am Pastor Niles, a very close friend of uh, Pastor Antoine, deceased. I could miss the funeral. So I'd just like to express sincere condolences on behalf of my family, Sylvia, and my children, and the saints at Greenville. God bless you, and condolences. Thank you. So it's um, now time we will just move on from the uh, one, one minute tribute. I believe it's about 12.45, and we do have some three-minute tributes. Um, the first one would be um, from Pastor Eddie of the People's Church. That's this church right here where mom attended. That will be followed by the women's ministry, and then um, finally would be a tribute from the community representative. I'm not sure if the member of the community, I believe it's either Mello or Cecil, um, we'll see who, who shows up. Okay, he's right here. Cecil would be. So, Pastor Eddie, please. Good evening, everybody. A tribute to Sister Alexander. Sister Alexander was a flower indeed. She brought light, life, fragrance and joy to the members of the People's Church, both old and young. In Proverbs 31, verse 10, the question is asked, who can find a virtuous woman? And the church surely found the answer in Sister Alexander, who have been a long-standing 
and faithful member. A woman of strength. And God promised three scores and ten. By virtue of strength, she got to four scores and ten. To us, the young people, or the younger ones, she was a mother, a mentor, a counselor. Many of us experienced her counsel in the moments she became vulnerable and openly shared lessons from her own life. If I had to use some words to describe the woman we celebrate today, I would use these five words. V, I, O, L, E, T. V, she was vibrant. She participated in many of the activities of the church with distinction. Who can forget, who can forget those wonderful renditions during the testimony times? Or the outstanding voice with the ladies when they sang or the goodies produced while the men work. Sister Alexander performed many leadership roles here at our church. She was a member of the church board and served in just about every position in the women's ministries department. I, she was industrious. When it came to the women's ministries and their activities, especially those bring and buys, she was a go-to person. Many of these events were held right in front of her shop. Or she was optimistic. In the toughest of situations, like those mentioned in the Hall of Faith in the scriptures, she saw and, per and pursued the preferred future and encourage others to do the same. L, she was loving. She looked out for others with genuine care and concern. Many in the church and in the community on a whole can bear testimony to this. Her love and care for others was what led her on numerous occasions to open a home, especially to the ministers who were visiting the assembly. E, she was an encourager. Sister Alexander always had a word of encouragement for someone. A word to lift your spirit when you were down. A call just to find out how you were doing. Or the word of scripture she will give which kept you afloat in the difficult times. Take care of yourself. Keep living for Christ. I remember the time before the last that I visited her and I asked, how are you doing? And her response was, if I tell you, you would tell somebody else. <laughs> we had a good laugh and then that was followed by keep serving the Lord. T, she was a teacher. She taught others what she knew. And like an authentic teacher, she did not just use words to teach, but she taught by example. Indeed, she was a true example for many persons in this congregation. Today, we mourn, not like those who do not have hope, for we, knew, for we know that you live for Christ. So we celebrate you. We celebrate your strength, your love for Christ and others, your wisdom and virtue. Take your place among those who have gone before. Continue to sleep, to sleep in peace, Sister Alexander, until that day when we all gather to worship together once more. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Eddie, for those wonderful words. It will make mom very proud, and um, as it has made um, the family and those gathered here. And um, we'll have a little change in um, the order. Uh, the ladies for the church choir, they not, have not arrived yet. Some of them are coming from work. 
So we'll postpone that to some other time in the program. We will not forget it because um, I don't think my mom will forgive me if I were to omit it. So at this time, we will have the community um, representative. I thought I saw, Ce uh, is it Cecil? Okay. So if you'll come, and uh, before you start, I'd just like to let you know that um, Mom was really a person of the community, and, um, and the community also was, um, they always was there for Mom in times of need, and uh, so this is a very special moment, um, so go ahead, uh, Cecil. Thank you. Afternoon, sisters and brothers, everyone. Yeah. I'm not sure if I could do this in three minutes, but I will try. Um, First of all, let me start by saying that in putting this little tribute together, I had to try to figure out exactly how I should structure it. So first of all, speaking on behalf of the community in general, and in particular, the St. Paul Sports, Cultural and Development Organization, and the Comanchero Steel Orchestra, I thought we need to look at her, our dear friend, mother, mentor, as a community elder. Not just because of the age of 90 which she attained, but the truth is that for so many of us, the knowledge which we gathered from her, the many times some of us would have had opportunity to meet and chat with her, it meant a lot of us, to, to most of us, if not all of us. When someone dies, knowing they live a good life, it is an important opportunity for all of us left behind to praise, glorify, and honor that person for what they have done. And please be clear, I am not saying we treat them and behave as if that person was God or they were without fault or challenges. But the truth is our sister, Miss Alexander, as most of us refer to her, lived a good life. And for this, we must be thankful and not lament and ponder and grieve excessively about her passing. And I'm saying that I know for the family it will be tough. But the truth is that I think we we'll all share the opinion that she is in a better place. As Grams Morgan says in his song, there is a place for people like you. Ms. Alexander has touched the lives of so many of us in the community, whether it meant just listening to her stories, whether they were good or bad, and of course when they were needed, or when we needed upliftment, she was there to do that for us. She was a very good listener. She was of the person whose doors were always open to whoever, to whoever came by. She was a true mentor, a mother to all of us. As a family person, she was exemplified in the community for her service. And I wouldn't speak about it in case of her children, even, even if I think I could take liberty to do some of that. But for us, outside of our immediate family, she was truly a mother to all of us. And permit me to mention a few names, which I try to stay away from, but you'll understand why. Anthony, who we call Bongawe. Dorothy, Eunice, Johnny, Pivot, and a few others. Mr. Alexander took all of these people as her very own children. But hear what? to each and every one of them who had friends and family, they were treated likewise. So for example, if I came to the shop where Johnny was carving, you don't know if I was one of us child or not. When I was in the veranda, in the veranda speaking with her and Eunice, it was the same. I was just hanging out in the shop with Dorothy, it was the same treatment. And it wasn't just for me but everybody else who passed by. Family meant so much to her. I still recall on the passing of her husband, 
the amount of strength she showed to us as young ones in the community. Not that I want to take you back to the event, but it is important to remember. I still remember being in the house speaking to herself and Miss Chrissy. And she was the one, in some cases, giving us support and saying, everything will be okay. There's no need for us to be grieving and mourning and wondering what's happening. She was surely a pillar of strength and encouragement. I'm certain at the same time it was a difficult period for her, but what she showed to each and every one of us was testimony of a true Christian woman who believed and believed that despite the circumstances, all will be well. She was truly a mother to the community, and I heard Eddie made mention of it, so I will refrain from some of what he said. I could still think of the times when I'm around by the shop and you see the children from the mother school passing by. And based on how they were carrying themselves, she was sure to deal with them. She was, it was important that what they say and how they say it was well done. It was a matter of reminding them of the importance of attending school and being punctual, yes, being on time. When she had to pull up or manners one of us, including the children, there was no stopping her. I can still hear her voice calling out from the shop to unknown children in a very authoritative way. Hey, you, stop. Stop that. Or hey, you, come here. And they will come. I think she actually got into that kind of colloquial mood anytime she saw the need to discipline someone. Yeah? In the community, we did a number of events, and I will just highlight two. We had what was referred to as the City of Lights and the Independence Extravaganza. And I tell you what, where she bore position was ideal for us. She looked out for us. She was the one who was there to support us in so many different ways. As a matter of fact, when we had those events, we always ensure that we did a special invitation for her. Whether it was something from Comancheros or the sports club, we always make sure she was specially invited. The truth be said, and there's no doubt, I think the evidence are there, we treated her as VIP. I know there were times when we invited her to things and we decided we're going to escort her to her seat. She will stop and she will tell us, no, we don't need to do it. But the truth is we always felt the need to treat her that way because of how much she did for us. And we were able to make sure that while she was alive, in our own little way, we give her her flowers. She was the one who would look out and say, and call to say, a light is left on in the community center. Or in the cases when carnival came around and the pans were outside, she would call to say, the children are playing the pan. We don't want it to be on tune. And things like that, she always looked out for us. As a caretaker, when coming to the compound of the community center, you want to get her upset, leave the grass to grow tall. <laughs> and she will call and remind us, Sis, Mello, what's going on? Nobody's cutting the grass. It needs to be cut. And the truth is that we would get there and cut in the grass and then we will get some refreshment, <laughs> not knowing that it's coming, but it came, you know? So she was really the eye and ears when it came to the community. She was there to hear, to see what's going on, and to keep us on spot. Only this morning, one of my colleagues sent a message in the WhatsApp group, and it said this. Speak in such a way that others love to listen to you. And listen in such a way that others love to speak to you. I couldn't help but taking that and bringing it here today to say this is exactly how we all felt about Miss Alexander. Despite when she have to pull you up, you need to listen and you would want to listen. She was that person. Love for Cheros was apparent and stemmed from the fact that her husband was one of the early pan players. And yes, we had the opportunity to talk about that. For those of you who don't know, Brad, yes, he played pan at an early age. When children and others were formed to be playing the pan or pulling the stands around, 
she will quickly get it to our attention or call out to them to have them stop. At times she will ask me, like the following day, one noise all they were making it last night. <laughs> now this was a regular question she would ask anytime she thinks the steel band wasn't playing something right. And you got to get it right. And she, of course, she would remind me that coming out from our house was some top musicians. I also remember that. Whether I was playing the guitar or the piano. But the good thing about it is that when we played well, she referred to it as not noise, but music. And she would compliment us. So she was always there to steer us. She was always seeking our best interests. From a spiritual standpoint, she was a true believer, and she practiced that. I still remember her at a regular attendance in church, although I didn't attend here, but I will see her on the road. And I will tell you this. In her latter days, there were a few times when I met her on the road coming to church and stopped and offered her a ride. And she would refuse, insisting that God will take care of us. She would be able to get to church and back. I remember once her saying, this is my way of saying thanks to God, that I can still move, so I will not take the ride, I will walk, even if she had her cane. She lived what she spoke. She practiced what she preached. She was a true matriarch. She was a woman of power, strength, influence, love, and most of all, portrayed the life of a child of God. As we say farewell to her from this earthly sojourn, the best way we can honor her is to take a page or two from the many good deeds that she did while around and to apply them to our own life, along with the good memories we left of her. May she rest in eternal peace in the arms of her maker. Thank you. Thank you, Cecil. That was wonderful. And um, so, as we move into another phase of the um, the today's proceedings, um, uh, are the the folks ready for the choir? Not as yet. Okay. Well, please just give me a signal when they're here, and we'll fit them into the program as necessary. Okay. Okay. My name is Ivor Alexander, and one of the six children of what who we call mom. All right. As you might know as Violet Elizabeth Alexander. I'm the youngest. So in our midst today we have Milroy, Carol, Claudia, George. And uh, so these are children that are present with us here today. And uh, most of you would know Freddie or Alfred, who is not here. He was not able to make it, but I'm sure he's watching online. So I would like to express a warm welcome to each and every one of you who have come out to this time of celebrating the life of our dear mother. So we are here today, and it's a time of sadness, a time of mourning, but we do not mourn like those who do not have hope. And the reason is that mom, she died in Christ. And when you die in Christ, you die well, because you know you're assured that you'll be going to a better place. Today will also be a day of careful reflection, as we have already seen from those who have spoken, where we will reflect on the life of our dear mother. But it will also be a time of great celebration. All right? So, what are we celebrating? We'll be celebrating Mrs. Voilet. Elizabeth Alexander's life. So again, I would like to say a warm welcome 
So everyone who is here and those who are watching online, I'd like to say a welcome to the many pastors who are represented here today. Of course, the women's ministry. I would like to say very much a welcome to members of the Alexander and extended family. And a welcome to our parliamentary representative, Honorable Gregory Bowen, who is with us. To all of the family and friends, a warm welcome. And at this time, I would like to call Reverend Don Ray Wilkinson, who would lead us in a time of prayer. Good evening, all. Special welcome to my pastors, parliamentary representatives, family. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have gathered here today to celebrate the life of our dear sister, Alexander. Uh, you have blessed her, God, with a life that bears much fruit for you, Father, fruit that would last beyond her days here on earth, Father. God, I thank you, O oh God, for her family that are here and those who are watching via Zoom. I pray, God, that at this time you would comfort them, that you would minister to them, that they would reminisce on her life, a life lived for you. God, a life lived pleasing to you, O oh God. God, I pray, God, they remember, God, the sacrifices she made to honor you, God, and that you would be glorified even through this time, God, as we celebrate our life. Continue ministering to us. I pray, God, that you would comfort all of us, God, as we go through this time of mourning, oh God. By your spirit, give us the strength and everything that we need, God, to make it through this time. God, I pray, oh God, especially for the family, oh God. May your grace and your peace be upon them at this time, God, even the community as we mourn a loss of a, a woman that, that has been a mother to many, oh God. Pray, God, that through this time, oh God, every time we think about her, we remember you, and all honor and glory will go to you. Have your way as we go through this service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Carol Alexander Antoine, and I am the daughter of Mrs. Alexander. Uh, just before we lead the song, I'd like to have the undertake the funeral director come up to close the um, the casket, please. Yep. Where is that person? He's coming. Yeah, okay.
as we join together in singing the hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Man. It's written in your programs. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. And do better than that. Let me hear you say praise the Lord. What a friend we have in Jesus. Do you believe that today? Our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. What a friend we have in Jesus.
Marsha Beckford. I am the granddaughter of Mrs. Alexander. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keenan Alexander, and I am one of the grandsons of Miss Alexander. So today I was asked to read a part of the scripture for you all today. And I was told that this was my grandma's or one of my grandma's favorite passages in the Bible. So it is my honor today to be able to stand here with you all and read it for you. Today I will be reading Psalms 103, Psalms 103, and here I go. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. He, the Lord, is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, yet abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our inequities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from the everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his domain. Praise the Lord, my soul. Amen. That's a wonderful, wonderful song and excellently read by Keenan. And those were some great songs, right? Those are some of mom's favorite and you guys sung it well, so I'm sure she'll be very pleased. And at this time we are gathering to do a, a one a sing, a family song, one of mom's favorite. And we'll also be joined by Zoom online. So... Here we go. The name of the song is All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
morning, everybody. I think this would be the perfect time to have the women do their song. It was supposed to be me, but I'm giving up my spot. So women, come on up and sing, and I'll follow you.
Please give them another hand. That was a wonderful song. Wonderful. Well sung. That was one of mom's favorite. And um, yeah, so true. Home at last. I'm sure she's enjoying it. Good afternoon again. I am Claudia Samuel, one of the daughters, well, one of two daughters, the younger one. <laughs> this poem is called God's Garden. God looked around his garden. By the way, you guys know mom loved gardening. She loved flowers. She loved planting whatever she planted it. So God looked around his garden and he found an empty place. He then looked down upon this earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He knew that you were suffering. He knew you were in pain. He knew that you would never get well on earth again. He saw that the road was getting rough and the hills are hard to climb. So he closed your weary eyelids and whispered, peace be mine, be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you, but you didn't go alone. For part of us went with you the day God called you home. This poem is written on the back of some forget-me-not flower seeds. On the way out, you'll each get one per family. Please plant it in memory of mom. Thank you. Well, that was so lovely and she, that was a surprise and she do, always does that she always does things that surprises us so <laughs> that is my younger sister <laughs> well we're gonna stand again and we're gonna sing this beautiful rousing chorus everybody ought to know who Jesus is we sang it at our dad's memorial and mom wants us to sing it again so let's all stand together everybody standing and everybody's singing, nobody, everybody's singing. I can't see whether you're singing or not, so you have to be honest. God is seeing. <laughs> everybody ought to know. try a little thing here. It's, few, it's a celebration of life service, so it's not a regular funeral. So if I do something a little bit different, pardon me, right? So, some people are going to say, everybody ought to know. That's half to that. This half to that. And then this one will say, some people don't know. There are a lot of people who don't know who Jesus is yet. So we want them to know too. So you're going to say, what are you saying? Everybody ought to know, and you singing, some people don't know. They're going to help you, right? So let's go. We sing it all together, and then we're going to split. You got me? All right, let's go. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Everybody ought to 
And in, in the most important thing we, are, we ought to know about Jesus yeah. is that he is our Savior, and he's our Lord, and he can be all your Savior and your Lord if you have not yet received him. God bless you. Thank you for sharing in the singing. You may have your seats. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't know how I'm going to top that carol, but <laughs> I'll try. Um, I am Andre Alexander. I am one of the grandsons of Violet Alexander. Um, I was the first grandson, so I can claim that. <laughs> All right. I'm going to be reading some scripture. Um, from my understanding, these were some of the scriptures that she heard in her last few days with us. Um, so I'll be reading from Romans 8, starting at 18, um, and I'm reading out of the NIV version. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to the frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the fr first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God fore, foreknew, he also pre, uh, predescended to be conformed, conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many 
brothers and sisters. And those he predescended, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who died, or I'm sorry, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with them, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Good afternoon, and I'm George Alexander, I'm the proud father of the young man who just read. <laughs> proud father of the uh, first grandson. And my wife is here too with a white hat uh, up front there. Um, she is Jacqueline Alexander, and she was a vital part of this church between 1978 and 79. You young people wouldn't know about that. Uh, by the way, um, I've been sweating profusely from the time I left, you, from the time I landed on last week, Tuesday, and I can't stop, so I'm sweating off a lot. Of, this little guy is sweating off a lot of LBS, if you know what I mean. Anyway, again, thank you for taking the time to celebrate mom's incredibly nice life with us. Mom's was a beautiful, well-lived life. Now, she, now she's resting peacefully in God's presence, and the God, the God with a capital G that she served for most of her life. How many of you enjoy, um, how many of you enjoy stories? about super special people. I do too. However, I don't like fictitious stories. I'm in favor of nonfiction, uh, true, authentic, if you will. The short stories I'm about to share are genuine. To the best of my ability, um, over the years, I've heard names like Mrs. Violet Alexander, Mrs. Violet, Mrs. Alexander, Auntie Violet, Auntie, Cousin Vi, Cousin Violet, Sister Alexander, etc., etc. To us siblings, she was mom, mammy, mommy, the queen etc. 
our mom was the greatest. So don't argue with me. <laughs> Many times she did the job of both parents effectively and efficiently. The queen was the family's spiritual leader, bookkeeper, accountant, banker, money manager, homemaker, shopkeeper, sales lady, etc., etc., on and on. And mom, don't argue with me with this one either. Mom was the best cook ever. So, and that's final. There's no argument. Mom, mom would often say, I would rather take care of my family than buy a new and needed dress. So God provided for both the family's needs and mom's new dress because she enjoyed dressing up. Just a few years ago, mom told me a story that literally floored me and had me in a tearful, jaw-dropping awe. She gave me a blow-by-blow a, a blow account of all she did on Saturday, February 20th, 1954, leading up to my birth on early Sunday morning, February 21st, 1954. Some of you are doing some math there. <laughs> and you're probably saying I'm lying about my age. Okay, so in short, at nine months pregnant on that Saturday, mom made several long trips on the bus and on foot to get provisions, groceries, and water, water for the house. That was brutal. On the final trip back to the house along the narrow muddy trail, she was backing the bushes, you know, to get by. Mom fell face down on her stomach. She was in a lot of pain that was not letting up. Her pain was so unbearable that she commanded dad to go and get the outlawed midwife. You see, Grenada had outlawed midwives because too many babies were dying at childbirth. When the illegal midwife delivered me, my entire head was covered in blood. That's what mom told me. I didn't say that. I didn't remember that. So mom, mom was hemorrhaging inside from that fall. The God mom served and we served used that illegal midwife to perform miracles for both mom and me. I am now 68, in case your math didn't work. <laughs> and in great health, mom, the queen, made it to 90. That's 90 years and nine days. Once we moved to St. Paul's in about 1966, I became the, well, was one of the dough kneader. You need the dough, yeah? And on Saturdays, part of my chores was to catch, kill, and take the feathers off the chicken. Then my mom would, would, would take it from there, from there. She would cut it up and stuff. I'll never do that job again. No more. I needed or prepared the dough for fry bakes and bread, but at a personally rewarding price. As a 12-year-old and up, I would eat about four or five bakes loaded with butter while we fried them. As soon as they came out of the pot, butter, whipped butter, remember? I used to make that whipped butter from the cow's milk. Then I ate my regular share of bakes with my brothers and sisters. Ha! Confession is good for the soul, huh? All right. All right. 
<laughs> then I ate my regular share of the bakes, yes. Mom did nothing to stop the tapeworms from being fed. So I went to school full of bakes. <laughs> Similar story on the bread. Since I worked my tail off to knead the dough, I got to sample it first. Hot with lots of, lots of butter. <laughs> lots of butter. Our new house in St. Paul's had a crude stairway. When you go up from downstairs with a trap door at the top of the stairs. Some mornings I would run down the deaf trap wood, the, the, the deaf trap wood stairs, sprint through the kitchen while mom got out of the way and out the door and I would scale the four foot concrete block wall and land on the little, little piece of lawn outside. Needless to say, mom thought I was crazy. But she enjoyed my entertainment though. Now, I need to get serious for my final, uh, sort of final, but most important story. Mom often told the story of when she was very young, she was taken to the general hospital with an unknown illness. The doctor told her she was dying. The queen said some unknown person came into her hospital room and prayed for her, for her healing. Mom prayed, then said, God, if you heal me, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Mom walked out of the hospital healed, and she served God faithfully until the afternoon of April 4th, 2022. It was said that mom has never seen that good Samaritan since that day, and she believed she had an encounter with an angel. That's what she believed. I believe her. When we were growing up, mom would wake up about 4.30 a.m. I said 4.30, and pray loudly for us. Many, uh, uh, many others and many others outside of the family. And she would pray, pray loudly calling each of us by name. Then she would huddle us together and pray again. She ran a godly family and her prayers continued to be answered by God. Growing up, we were in church about six days a week. And we were commanded to sit together towards the front of the church. When I was about 13, I got tired of going to church. So I told my mom, this one Sunday was the last time I am attending church. And in fact, that I was leaving her house. Yes, at 13 years old. Mom looked, looked at me, she laughed, and said, well, yes, we, <laughs> is so? In retrospect, I believe the queen prayed the devil out of me. <laughs> that Sunday, I, I walked into the church and sat down at the back, right at the back of this row here. In rebellion, hoping to walk out before church was over, pack my bag, and leave her house. <laughs> About two minutes before the pastor finished his sermon, it felt like someone grabbed my arm, lifted me to my feet, and walked me down the hardwood floor. Clock, 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 clock. Right down that side there. Yeah. And I knelt down at the altar up front here. The preacher finished his sermon, then led me in the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus Christ into my heart. I got home and laid on my bed and did not say a word. I 
laid on my bed, I just took my shoes off, and laid on my bed with all my clothes, and I was just laying there on my back. Mom came home, smiled and, at me, and did not say a word. That was the end of my rebellion. That's the rebellion that never started, actually. I like those. And I've been trying my best with God's help to serve him since that day. This was all because of a mother's prayer. She was a praying lady, of course. That's the queens and others persistent in prayer for all of us. Never underestimate the power of a mother's prayer. You see, the decision to rest in peace should be made before we die. Because according to biblical accounts, and specifically citing the rich man and Lazarus story in Luke 16, 19 through 31, it's impossible to make the decision to rest in peace after one dies. Mom, the queen, is resting, is truly resting in peace in God's presence right now. She's not in that box. I mean, there's a body there. I mean, you can look at, at her body. It's beautiful. They did a fantastic job. But her soul is in heaven. The queen is resting in peace in God's presence now. Thank God, and God bless you all. I heard quite a few things that I've never heard before. <laughs> the first was when Ivor called me Milroy. <laughs> he has never called me by that name before. <laughs> but that's me. And there's actually a little story behind that real quick. Um, throughout my life up until the day I attended high school, I was called Roy, and I had never seen my birth certificate until I was at GBSS that day, and it said Milroy. Now how, after all these years, could I get accustomed to that name? I actually refused to use that name, and I referred to myself throughout GBSS by my middle name first. Right? And my new name, second. My, my actual diploma from GBSS says Augustine Milroy Alexander. <laughs> so when I got to the United States, my great aunt, who had been there at the time 28 years, she would introduce me to her friends and others as Roy. So when I, but when I introduced myself to others, I said, I'm Milroy. <laughs> so consequently, half the people who know me in the United States, they know me as Roy, and the other half know me as Milroy. <laughs> so I'm actually both. I do want to say good afternoon to all of you, everyone, it truly has been Wonderful, a wonderful experience to see you all here to help in the celebration of our mom. I'm the eldest of the six children of Violet Alexander, and you've heard we called her mom. Our father passed about 16 years ago, and at his memorial service, I did the eulogy. And that was following a unanimous vote among the siblings. They said, uh, he's the oldest, let him do it. Here I am today, and it's different. It was supposed to be different. But anyway, let me just say this again. I am Roy Alexander. I, I left here 
50 years ago and moved to Denver, Colorado. I have here with me my beautiful wife, Cheryl. Um, I am a big believer in diversity in all things, in inclusion, all right? That's a big term today. And I'm a collaborative person. So those three things are me. So this time around, with my mom having passed, and there's a need for a eulogy. By the way, so far there's been about a dozen of those eulogies today. So I hope you don't get bored by mine. Um, so, so this time around, I thought, given my collaborative and inclusion spirit, that it would be a great opportunity for someone else to give the eulogy. Perhaps another sibling. I lost again. I thought I really had a good case. It's mom, so maybe the eulogy should be presented by Carol or Claudia. I thought that matched up kind of well, all right? It did not. I thought perhaps since the oldest did it back then, maybe the youngest should do it this time. But no, I lost again. Anyway, put all of that aside, all the fun aside, I am very proud of every one of my siblings and the entire family. So here I am with you today. Thank you again for coming and for tuning in, those of you online, thank you all. What I'm gonna to try to do today, despite the fact that you've heard a lot, you have many themes, and I almost feel like I don't need to deliver my comments because the, th the themes are embedded in what you've heard so far in some way, some fashion or another. I, want to do, I do want to frame, though, a sort of collage of our mother and who she really was. At some point, I have to say this, this, the passing of our mom, hit me much harder much, much harder than it did our dad. So, there may be some times during this, these remarks that it may be tough for me like now. <laughs> but I'm sure you will understand. So I want to start with who was mom? Who was Violet Elizabeth Alexander? Mom went to St. Dominic's Roman Catholic Church, uh, School, a primary school in St. David, but she was one among many unfortunate students who by virtue of their limited economic means um, didn't quite have the privilege of a high school education. That didn't stop mom. However, it didn't stop her from making a very significant impact during her life. An impact on her family, both immediate and extended. An impact on her neighborhood. An impact on the larger community as a whole. And from what I'm learning today on the whole island, and maybe more than that, Mom, in her own way, quietly developed and perfected her own repeatable way of connecting with people, of engaging people, and touching those around her in so many aspects of her life that she became one of the most well-known persons, certainly, in her community. And if you think our dad knew a lot of people, which he did, I'm willing to bet that mom probably knew far more than he did. And a lot of that because of all the good she rep represented and in a way, her manner of allowing people to like her. And so she was blessed that she got to live a full life, a full 90 years and nine more days many more than most do. 
One may ask how could someone like her with a little to no education have or make such significant impact in her life? How did this happen? How could this happen to this young woman from this little, I'll call it village, downhill 60, down Berat Road in Mondelez? Well, there actually were or are some signs and traits that when you look back at them, help tell the story. And I wanna just share a few of them with you because they actually carried her and shaped her life as well as her children's and many others. She may not have named them by these signs or traits that I will list in a minute. Not specifically anyway in those terms, but you bet these are what they were. For example, mom had purpose. Purpose in her life. And that was her reason for living. To do good. To help others, no matter how small or how big the help was. That was mom. She had purpose. She was very humble, a very humble person. Never complained about the hand that she was dealt. She just played the cards that she was dealt. And she won. She won. She had drive, that type of energy that pushes you to to accomplish what you set out to do. She had that drive and that strong willpower. There was no quitting in mom. She never gave up. Not even as she endured the last most challenging days of her life. <laughs> Thank you. Mom had a vision too. Vision, that is so important to getting you where you wanna go. She had vision. I mean a long-term sort of place. Envision it your own individual way. But she had that long-term place or state of, of, of being that she wanted for her and for her family and everyone. A vision that was not spoken specifically there was no actual big, like they say today, bold tagline. It wasn't a vision statement like Microsoft. You know, they're the computers uh, folks. Microsoft said, a computer on every desk. She, it wasn't like that. But you had to read and inter interpret. When you saw the smoke coming from her, you had to interpret what that, what that sign, what that smoke was, te was telling. But she also lived that vision by her actions and the character of the person she exhibited every single day because she just lived by that vision, that code. And when she was all done, she left a legacy of pure kindness, doing good, and the constant pursuit of things that are better. How did this all happen? I want to just share with you, I call them exhibits, four of them. Several years after I was born, mom and dad had to drop out of school and find a new path to care for us, their children. And I'm sure they knew it wouldn't be an easy journey. Exhibit one. Grandmother's gift. Mom's grandmother, Wilhelmina Edwards, we call her Ms. Jepson, as that's how she was referred to respectfully, and who had 10 children, said to mom, you need a place to raise those children. Here's a small piece of land next door to grandmother. Take it and build a house. The gift of property build a house. 
This was a gift of a helping hand with a message that would be the beginning of a sort of transformation of her life. They say owning a home helps you build wealth. So it was an up, an up, the beginning of an opportunity to transform her life. It was a gift of a lifetime that would impact her because she, in essence, would pay it forward. Grandma gifted to her, she would pay forward that kindness, that gift, constantly doing that. It was purposeful living and it would cement her journey for the rest of her life. So out of that gift of a little land would come so much. It led her to a beautiful life of kindness, of generosity, of drive, and the pursuit of, I call it, better. Could have said best. That all together helped her become so well known. She was so good at commands, you heard some of them today, that she constantly nudged and reminded us all to go to church, do your homework, play later, eat your food, it's good for you. Eat your carrots. Last time I spoke with her, she said that. But she, she would say, eat your carrots, it's good for you, and especially it's good for your eyes. But you know what, unfortunately, that one didn't help her as much as she would have like, as you know, she lost her eyesight in the last days. She said, take your vitamins, be yourself. Learning is better than silver and gold. That is one I just could never forget. So that was the exhibit one, the gift of grandma. Exhibit number two, <laughs> the neighborhood convenience store. Years later, in the early 1960s, maybe around 1962, it seems consens there's consensus around that. After the house was built on, uh, built on that little piece of land, mom and dad didn't simply rest with the comfort of their new home. They began something that sort of meets the idea of leveraging. Okay, so you have land, leverage that to do more. And with no business education, no training, in entrepreneurship, no experience, and led by mom, who already had her hands full with all of us. They would start a business. How bold was that? And where would you ask? So, they would dig beneath that house and carve out a portion of the, of the dirt and built, built out a first generation, early generation, mini neighborhood convenience store. We called it the shop. That shop, as we called it, became a go-to place for the residents of the neighborhood. Small, but it was a go-to place. And it would serve their needs as a destination for certain foods that they needed to fill out the daily needs of the families, of the families around. Rice, flour, sugar, meat, chicken, many other dry goods, and on and on and on. And not surprisingly, her character traits of the drive, the willpower, the kindness, the pursuit of better, and now a new one, especially related to the business, was trust. All became a part of mom's of the way mom ran the business and built its reputation. You didn't have money today at the time that you went to the shop, or maybe pay payday was a couple of weeks away. In other situations like that, mom would take IOUs, and she didn't write them down. Those who know me, I, I, documentation is important, and I don't, I don't, fool around with that, with not having documentation. But mom didn't necessarily write it down. What she did instead was designate George to be the bill collector, <laughs> all right? But mom trusted people. She knew that she was gonna get paid. So she did not mind. She understood why they weren't able to 
bring along the cash that day to pay for what, she, what they needed. So she extended that hand again, that helpful hand, and that meant a lot to her. And I, I can't think of anyone who did not pay, right? But that was mom. Meanwhile, while she was while she was doing this and again paying it forward and passing the kindness her grandmother Jepson showed her, she was helping her community, she was helping the residents and families while building that trust I mentioned in them and their trust in her. And this good leverage of value didn't stop there. It was at the shop, that shop, that all six of us worked, observed, learned firsthand some of the valuable fundamental lessons of business operations. Some of us using it more deeply than others. We did also eat some of the, pro some of the profits. You had to. Yeah. But that was okay with mom. Today, all of us though, I can say we have dabbled in business in some way, some bigger than others as I just mentioned. But the experience certainly helped lead us all to our own respective degree of financial independence. Exhibit three, the move, the big move. I call it the big move. The shop operations continued actually in St. Paul's, as you know, at our current location, but the operations ceased about 50, year, 50 years after um, it was uh, first started. Our family moved to St. Paul's in 1966, a couple of years before I graduated from GBSS. But what I want to share with you here is about mom and how she got to St. Paul's, how we got to St. Paul's, and how that move impacted her children. Mom always wanted a better place for us, for her, for us, and her family. And that was a huge part of her long-term vision that she had for us. It was mom who picked that location down the road across the ball field, community center. It was mom who picked that location for us to move to from Mandelis. It was sometime during, I think, around 1964. Um, it was she who, while walk, either walking or riding a bus home one day, saw a sign advertising a that that land was for sale. Mom took note of it, followed up, and inquired about it in pursuit of purchasing a spot for her home. But it was not by any means an easy nut to crack, not by any means, to get this piece of land sold to her. I won't be specific, but I'll just say this. Mom wanted to buy that a piece of that land. And perhaps due to some type of economic profiling of mom, there was a strong attempt to redirect her to purchase a piece of land in a different area in Mount Panassas. But mom, who was driven by her vision for us, and the determination to win, the strong will to succeed, she got the deal done and the home was built. That accomplishment was so pivotal to the whole family. It was mom who first met one of our new neighbors there in St. Paul's. That was the family of Mr. and Mrs. Godwin Brathwit. They lived across from our home there um, in a very large, beautiful mansion with long steps up to the main level. That's been since replaced by the now com community center. One day, Mrs. Brathwit, 
another very kind woman herself, was waiting on a bus outside our house. And she, of the mansion, reached out and introduced herself to mom, and that set off what would be a long, indelible relationship that ultimately made a huge impact on our family, especially on my siblings and me. Our two families would interact on numerous levels. They made, they made us feel welcomed in the neighborhood and always provided us words of encouragement. We played together with their children and we were even given some of their books, by the books and toys. And many years later, when they left St. Paul's, we would still visit them. And by the way, at the time, Godwin Brophit was uh, either chief education officer for the, uh, the government, and later he was, I believe, cabinet secretary of some, some, someone could correct me, but he was, a, he was an educator, and he wanted well, to, he wanted well, good things for, for people, so he helped us. Thank you. There may be someone from the Brophit family in here, so a big thank you to, to you. The bottom line, though, is we learned a lot from, from them because they were a plentiful and very genuine source of motivation and general information that helped us all, a huge influence on our, on our family. Exhibit four, some testimonials. Some of you could... Feel free to have fun with some of these. I compiled these testimonials, descriptive of mom, as I took note to help sort of put the, my comments together. So far, my comments of mom, they present our views of mom. But here are some others that we share. I was speaking with one of those people who knew mom well, and he said, she was a grandmother to all the school kids. Grandmother to all the school kids. Another person who assisted her with taking care of the land around the house, whether it was cutting the grass, planting, whatever, and weeding the garden, har harvesting. He said that even though she paid him, the fee for the work that he did for her, she would have a meal prepared for him ready when he was done. She already, she's paying him, but she's paying him more with the kindness of a, a meal. You know, after you worked out there, you gotta have something to eat. Mom had a funny side too. I was told she loved going to funerals. And she loved that so much that she used to go to the wrong ones at times. <laughs> you know? She had a fantastic memory. Others said she could recite the Psalms without error. She was so generous, another said, that she made sure no school children were hungry. She believed in sharing. She provided temporary housing or shelter for school teachers, for several pastors. You heard that before. And other families, family members as well. And her door was always open. Just come on in, you know, have, have a chat. She was also very quick to reconcile and she had no enemies. And the last one I heard, and I just felt I should added to my list, which I was already prepared, was a longtime elected official <clears throat> who's currently still um, in such high elected uh, position said, mom called her, strangely enough, at some very odd times, like 8 or 8.30, not a.m., but p.m. You're calling an elected, elected official at eight o'clock at night. And she would say to him, don't listen to the negative stuff. I'm paraphrasing. 
Just keep doing all the good that you are doing. Words of encouragement, even to an elected official, all right? That's, that's mom. So I've been here for quite a while standing up here, so let me wrap this up real quickly. It won't be long. I have to say that I'm not sure what Webster's Dictionary would say about the definition of kindness and things like that, but I believe mom met the true definition of genuine kindness. And for all of her deeds and acts of kindness, she was surely blessed and, as I said earlier, lived that full life of 90 years. A life that gave her everything that she, that she a life that gave a life she gave her all to, her everything to. A life I'm sure she is certainly proud of. And we know that she is now happy and singing all the praises, all his praises, at her rightful place in heaven, knowing she has done her very best and that she shared with, and that we have shared with you today this message and the following closing words of encouragement from mom to all of us. Think big, be bold, like she was, take risks, and be better. Thank you. I believe these are the words that would be echoed from grandma. Grandma, say hi to daddy for me and grandpa and mama.
I thank you, Marsha. That was very beautiful. And now as we wrap things up, we would be, um, I see Reverend Stevenson Warm is coming to pre present uh, the, the message. Good afternoon to everybody. Whenever I stand here, I, it's very nostalgic, simply because uh, this church played a significant role in my life in one way or the other. And uh, some of the great lessons that I learned uh, came from this church. Some of the greatest memories that I had came from this church. Being, you know, to uh, see Ivan, George. I didn't know Roy because Roy must have <laughs> left uh, before my time. Claudia, of course. Still play the piano? Yeah, she used to play that thing across there. And she was all so energetic and rigorous about it. So those are the great times I remember. When I came from Bible school in 1988, uh, Reverend ESJW Munro was the resident pastor here, and I came back here to my home church. And I remember him telling me that I can go to Sister Alexander's shop every month in. And I found that that month used to take so long to reach. <laughs> and I was permitted, he told me I was permitted to take $70 worth of groceries. Not one cent more, is what he said. So I tried my best, of course, when we wrote our lists out. And I uh, journeyed down there uh, with my white and red and blue bag to get my $70 worth of groceries. And at times we didn't get it right. So there were times when, it never, by the way, it never fell under 70. <laughs> but there are times when it got up to 75 and 79, that sort of thing. And I think it reached a highest of 80 on one occasion. You know, but the beautiful thing about that is that whenever it went beyond its allotment, Sister Alexander will tell me, that's okay, she'll take care of that. And um, that to me was so nice of her. An extra $10 groceries back in 1988 was quite a bit, I should let you know. What a wonderful lady she was. I want to draw the attention though from John chapter 3 and... Uh, I would not read the entire passage. But there is a prelude to verse 16, which I suspect everybody knows. And I remember back then, of course, when we were little children, by the age of, I would say, three, four, everybody knew John 3.16. I don't think the same applies for today. But it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And usually that portion of scripture is pulled out without us fully grasping what in fact led Jesus to say this most known portion of scripture. And for us to understand the importance of this even greater, we then must back up to understand its prelude. And it all started when this seemingly older individual by the name of Nicodemus came to speak to Jesus. 
I don't get the impression that he was a young man per se. But the Bible says that there was this time when this Jewish religious leader by the name of Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to speak with Jesus and he selected a time to, to meet with Jesus during the night and I would not thrive to make any theological conclusion as to why he came by night. I've heard all sorts of stories about his night visitation over the years that he probably didn't want people to see him uh, being a, a religious leader and Jesus being a controversial person so he was not very humble and as a result he sought to see Jesus by night. That could well be the case as well as it might well be that that was the opportune moment that he got to check on Jesus. And this is so important. I think we need to look beyond the fact that it was night or he was trying to hide and all of those sort of things. But I think the most important thing we need to grasp is the fact that he came and checked Jesus out. And that is so very important in life. Because whether we want to be critical of him or not, we must applaud the fact that Nicodemus visited Jesus. Checked Jesus out. Wanted to find out something about him. Wanted to get some explanation. Wanted to get some vibes and wanted to get some knowledge uh, from Jesus. Wanted to glean and garner something. And though he was a teacher of the law and a rule of the law, he felt that he was able to get something more from Jesus. So let's not be hard on him. Because you know there are a lot of people who will spend their entire life whether it's 40 years or 50 or 100 or 90. And throughout that entire life that God has given to them, they'd never check Jesus out. <laughs> to me, I think that's the greatest tra tragedy that can happen to anybody in this life. To have touched down on this terrestrial ball, live a full life and never ever check out Jesus. It is it's amazing the people that we go to. It's amazing the people that we visit. It's amazing the people that we check out for help when we have certain situation. But alas, the primary individual that we should consult with and talk with and engage the Lord Jesus Christ Unfortunately, so many people never check him out. To me, that is the biggest tragedy that you could ever have in this life. Never to have checked out Jesus. You don't know what you would lose and what you would miss out in this life. Having gone through your entire life and never checked him out. We go to all kinds of people in this life. We go to doctors when we're sick. Nurses, of course, when we're sick. We go to the psychologists when we think that we have a problem that is bothering us too much. And when we feel discouraged and depressed, we will go to counselors to help us. And unfortunately, there are so many individuals, of course, and it's not estranged to Grenada and Grenadians that when they find themselves in the morass of problems, they do visit some strong, some strange places and some wrong people. There are some strange places in Grenada and there are some wrong people in Grenada. People that should not be visited 
but they are indeed visited. And sometimes it's amazing the kind of people who visit these people that should not be visited. And of course I'm talking about warlocks and witches and those people who are involved in bad. You visit them. And when you come out from them, the, 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 the last stage of you is worse than the first. And especially the time in which we live, when things are so tough, and the economic situation, not only in Grenada, but in the world as a whole, seem to be so devastating and seem to be riding our backs. And if, let me tell you something, that you don't know your source, and if you don't know God and have conviction about godliness, the situation in life and the vicissitudes that you face in life can push you to go in some wrong places. But thank God for those of, those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Though we face some tough times and rough times in this life, we know our souls and we know who can, we can go to. And whenever we go to Jesus, I can well assure you that you can never come out the same. There is always something that he's going to put into your life and put into your spirit. There is something that you can hold on to because Jesus is the way maker. He's the one that brings peace. He's the one that brings up abundant life. He's the one that people he's the good shepherd he's somebody that you can go to and when you come out from him is joy unspeakable and full of glory have you visited him in your 40 years in your 33 years that you have lived so far on this earth in your 42 years in your 50 years have you visited Jesus Has he told you anything at least that you can embrace and hold for the rest of your life? There are deposits that Christ will put into your life that you can embrace and you can hold for all of your life. It's going to keep you going. Some advice that people will give you would fade away, but that which Jesus deposits, deposits in your life, it remains forever. And it helps you, especially in times of crisis. So this man visited Jesus. And you know, there are a lot of people out there who are too proud. <laughs> this Jesus thing uh, seemed to make them feel belittled. As if this Jesus thing is for stupidies alone. <laughs> Wise people check out Jesus. People who want the best for their lives, they check Jesus out. And for people who have encountered the Lord and people who know Christ and people who are born again, do not let anybody try to convince you that you are a number one stupid. You're not stupid. In fact, you're the wisest creature that God has created. You're wise to check Jesus out. And so this ruler, teacher of the law, the Bible tells us he visited Jesus. And he obviously visited Jesus because he must have heard about him or he probably saw some things that Jesus did. He maybe heard about the miracles that he performed. Indeed he did because he suggested in the discourse that no man can do these things except God be with him. So he knew and heard about the miracles that Jesus did and they were not magic. There were godly miracles supernaturally done. And having heard and seen and experienced what Jesus was able to do, that's when he decided to visit Jesus. Don't you tell me that over the years you have had evidences 
of Jesus working in people's lives and transforming them, changing them from rottenness unto righteousness. Don't tell me that over all these years you have seen, you have observed that there were some people before they knew Christ. They were like bastards. They were rum drinkers. They, they smoked their lives out. They were immoral characters. And when Jesus came into their lives and when they came to Jesus and turned things around, you saw the kind of changes they had in life. Don't tell me that you have not observed over the years the changes in people's life who came to meet Jesus and know Jesus. Don't tell me that you have not seen it. The evidences are there that whom the Son of Man sets free is indeed free indeed. The evidence is indeed there that God can clean up any soul that is rotten and destined to hell and transform their lives into something great and something exciting and put them onto a new road and give them a new hope and a new life and a new destination. Don't tell me that you have not seen that. The evidences are there. And so Nicodemus came and he said, I have observed that you must have been sent from God based upon these miracles that you have done because no ordinary person can do these things. And you know what? For the usual, the normal person, the contemporary person who would like the limelight, would, 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 would quickly begin to uh, heave his chest, his chest up in, in, in show offness, so to speak. But Jesus just switches the thing around and tells him something that he did not expect. I marvel not, I say unto you, that you must be born again. You see, we live in a world, in a world where people don't really want to know the realities of situation. We would like everybody to tap us on the shoulder and tell us that we're fine. We would like everybody to tap us, we're on the road to hell and we still want everybody to tell us that we're fine. You're a good young man. You're a wonderful young man. You're a pretty young lady. You're an exciting person. You've got potential. There's a lot ahead for you. All of those things are good, but they ain't tell you that you are leading a life that brings you into eternal damnation. Everybody wants to hear nice things. And mind you, don't get me wrong because I like to hear nice things. All of us <laughs> love to hear nice things, don't we? And when we don't hear nice things, they impact us negatively. I remember my brother, the oldest one, who never raised his hand, never hit me to this day. Very much in contrast to my sister Cheryl, who seemed to have the ministry of beating. <laughs> it's like she was just glad to take advantage on her younger siblings. But my elder brother never once laid his hand upon me. But whenever I would upset him, all he would do is simply look at me and graphically describe me physically. None of which <laughs> was good. And that had its own impact on my life. Because when I went to the mirror, the mirror looked at me, smiled, and confirmed what your elder brother said was indeed true. <laughs> and impacted my life negatively. It's not a kind of thing that I wanted to hear. I'd prefer to hear, even though it may not necessarily be true, that I was a handsome looking guy. I know I'm not, I know I'm ugly, but I ain't some either. <laughs> I, I fall somewhere in between. It could work. <laughs> but in life, we want to hear good things. We don't want to hear at times even if we are, are obnoxious and our behavior is not so good. 
we're not so reputable. We, we don't do things that are so pleasing. We don't want to hear that we are corrupt. We don't want to hear that we are immoral. And even if you're immoral and corrupt, you don't want to hear that. You want everybody to declare how good a person you are. But Jesus was never like that. He told you exactly who you are, who you are. That's what he did. And he tells us even today who we are. And then it is left to us to determine whether we're going to change our life based upon what the Lord Jesus Christ tells us about ourselves or whether indeed we will continue on our own self-righteous path. I'll finish in five minutes, be assured. And so, Jesus told him something that had him bewildered. He couldn't understand this. What Jesus said to him then did not make any sense. The language of Christ was spiritual. And though this man was religious, and he was in fact... A maestro and a highly qualified teacher of the law, yet he did not understand the dynamics, yet simplicity of salvation. Because you see, that was spiritual. And spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so, in like childlike reasoning, he asked Jesus, how can a man be born again when he's old? So I don't get the impression that he was 20 or 30. He's referring to himself now. What are you telling me, Christ, about being born again? Can't you see that my grays are already here? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus says, said unto him that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marveleth not that I say unto you that you must be born again. Listen to me. Life does not consist of the abundance of things that a man possesses. Life that a man possesses. Life is not just about things and tangibles. In fact, the deeper things of life, they're immaterial. You cannot touch them. Those are the things that are valuable and important. Some things that you cannot see and touch and handle. Those are the important rudiments of life. And this religious leader who's supposed to be intelligent says, said to Jesus, but that's impossible. Do I have to climb back into my mother's womb and come out again? That sounds so stupid. And Jesus had to explain to him, no, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That's flesh. That's flesh. And all of us who have been born into this world understand that this is flesh. This is flesh and blood. What you see here is not all. There is a mortal part of man. And there is an immortal part of man. And if you only think about mortality, I want to let you know that there is something deeper than that. There is something called life eternal. Which mortal man must face. You must be born again. And this Jesus seemed to say to him, it's like a mystery. You can't put your hands on all the delicateness of it. But it is possible. It may not be fully understand and all the, as we make it. So Jesus says, you don't know, you do not have to go back into your mother's womb and be born. Again, that's not possible, you're too old for that. And I don't know the full discourse between Nicodemus and Jesus. 
Because very often our gospel does not give us blow by blow. But this encounter with Jesus, with this teacher of the law, obviously was life changing. Jesus impacted his life, changed his life. By the time Jesus, amen, is dead, this same Nicodemus became so convicted about the Lord Jesus Christ. He joins up with Joseph of Amathea and they wrap the body up of Jesus and put the spices involved in preparation for his burial. What brought about the change of this man? What brought about this attachment? How come uh, his life is now changed? He is now ready to take 70 pounds of precious spices and put it onto the body of Christ. That is simply because he met Jesus. They might be important, but not mandatory. Amen. And one of the things that is indeed mandatory is that in order for you to have eternal life and to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. May I underscore must. Listen to me. You could do all that you want in this life. You could try as much as possible to see how you can appease the wrath of God and appease his judgment. That does not in any way qualify you for eternal life. There are a lot of people who think that what they need to do is to give something. People meet me on the road and such and, and they tell me, well, pastor, you know, we go, I can't really come to church and such like. But just hold this somewhere, please, and put it in the offering. And they do it in a, such a way as if that kind of helps them, you understand, to give them some credibility in the kingdom of God. Hey, let me tell you something. What the Lord wants is not your money. What the Lord wants is you to change your life and to clean you up. You can deposit all the money that you have in the collection plate or basket. That doesn't change your eternal destiny. There are some things that are not mandatory. But born again to enter into the kingdom of God, that is mandatory. It's not mandatory to get married. You ain't must get married. <laughs> Am I right? It's good. It's honorable, says the Lord. But it's not mandatory. If you in sex, you ain't go dead. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right? So that is not mandatory either. If you don't have money, if you're not wealthy, listen, in life, it is not mandatory that you have a lot. You have a lot? Thank God. Thank God. Set not your affection on it. Amen. Thank God. God bless you with a lot. But that's not mandatory. There are some things that are not mandatory. Recognition is not mandatory. People don't have to know you. <laughs> even, if, even if the spotlight is not shown on you, don't get harassed over that. Even if it's just a couple of people that turn up in your funeral, that is okay. If you expected 25 people in your wedding and only 10 come, that is all right. Their coming is mandatory. Higher education is not mandatory. It's important but not mandatory. It's not needed for eternal life. It helps you to understand the dynamics in the receipt of eternal life. But high quality education is not a prerequisite for eternal life. And that is one of the reasons why I have become so very concerned. Lord have mercy. I see our children walking to school with the sacks on their backs bending over. It is so heavy with books. And you equip them with all the necessary paraphernalia to ensure that they get high level education. 
Alas, many of our parents never introduce their children to Christ. Because you yourself don't know Christ. You cannot introduce anybody to anybody that you don't know. And we have a bunch of children growing up today on church. Uneducated spiritually. They're, they're qualified as you know it all over the place with all sorts of degrees. But they don't know Christ. That to me is tragedy. High quality, quality education is not mandatory. Don't keep telling your children all I want you to get is the best education in the world. Yes, that's good. But before you can tell them that they should get the best education in the world, tell them get Christ first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and education will follow. Anybody here with me this, this afternoon? You're here with me. It's not mandatory. We make it sound as though it's mandatory. Don't worry, folk. Popularity is not mandatory. <laughs> it's not mandatory. That can, that can give you eternal life. Who cares? Even if you might be the least known in your community, who cares? Many friends, it's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. Friends are important. I have quite a lot of them, but they're not mandatory. What is mandatory for eternal life is the new birth, knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is mandatory for eternal life. Some time ago, one of the most noted and wealthiest women in the world, in Oprah Winfrey, declared that there are divers' path to get to God. There is no one prescribed way. You can go through many different avenues and ultimately connect with God and has eternal life. Dies from the devil himself. As far as I know, based upon the tenet of scriptures, that there is only one way, hallelujah, and only one person you can come through, and that is Jesus. There is only one way, and that is the blood of Jesus. Nothing else can wash away your sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is only one way, and that is the man Christ Jesus. And Nicodemus finally understood that, and his life was changed. Could somebody indeed dearly understand this? And that is only Jesus can change your eternal destiny. There is only one way and one mediator, the Bible says, between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. You are here today, and you came and you listened to all the great stories of this wonderful lady. Amen. And the reason why there are so many success stories about her and that her children and grandchildren have testimonies of the Lord Jesus Christ is that this woman of God lived out her life, amen, and lived out her faith in reflection of the life of Jesus Christ. We are going to go one of these days. And no matter all the decorated stories of what you did in the past and how nice you were and how pretty you were, if your eulogy cannot be decorated with the Lord Jesus Christ having been resident in your life, your eulogy is not impressive and it's all in vain. Let's pray, please. Dear kind and heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Sad as it might be, 
But this woman of God, lady of God who loved Jesus would be proud to hear or to know that at her funeral people were told about the importance of letting Jesus into their lives. That's what she lived by. That's how she walked. That's how she displayed her whole life consumed with passion for Christ. I pray, Father, as individuals sit here this morning, this evening, this afternoon rather, that nobody, Lord, would leave this church unconvicted about Jesus and changing their lives, those who have not yet done it. Even where they're sitting at this moment, Lord, I pray that they would make a simple, uncomplicated prayer that would simply ask Jesus to come into their lives and to change them and get them prepared and ready. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, and somebody who heard this word, his or her life would change and that they would turn to Jesus and look to him for help and to look to him for strength. May this message change somebody's life. We ask in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Warm, for that all-inspiring all message. Uh, let's hope that we all take it to heart. I know you have been sitting for a long time, and we are uh, running a little over time, but um, I'd be remiss if I did not um, say a few thanks. And I will have to be very careful because I'm sure that it will overlook. So please forgive me if I did not mention you by name because a lot of things are done um, behind the scenes that we might, and some names I don't even remember. So please forgive me. But I think it has been a wonderful day, a wonderful day of celebrating. Thank you all for the kind words that you have spoken, everyone who has spoken, the songs that have been sung. They've been all inspiring. And it really blesses our heart. It's the heart of the family. I want to say thanks to mom's brother, Uncle James, who sits right here at front. He's been a wonderful brother, always supporting, always being there for his wife, Aunt Lorna, and for his children, who are also here with us. Thank you. Mom had some wonderful friends, wonderful neighbors. But I want to say a special thanks to Dorothy Bruno and the Bruno family. They have been there for her every step of the way in supporting her wherever there was need. Wonderful neighbors like the Dakotas, Mr. and Mrs. Dakota. Whenever I call, mom would say she's just having a meal that was provided by the Dakotas. And for that, we are grateful, and I say thank you. Cousin Christine and Randy and many others who have helped, Randolph and many, they have been there for her every step of the way. Those are wonderful relatives to have, very supporting. I want to thank the Alexanders, the other sets of Alexanders, Keith and June, for being there. Mom has told me many stories of your support, the food that you provide, and the words of encouragement for Anthony and Gertrude, who is here. I'd like to thank the, my siblings. I came in late, so they did all the hard work. That's why they have me up here doing, the, um, doing all of this stuff, whatever it's called. Right? They came in early and they did all the planning. They worked tirelessly to put this on. So, thank you. I'd like to thank the church and for opening up your doors so that we can come 
and have this time of celebration. The musician, the technical team. I'd like to thank those who are listening online who couldn't be here in person. These beautiful flowers, aren't they beautiful? Wonderful flowers. Absolutely amazing. We were a little concerned that there was not enough flowers. But, you know, we serve a mighty God, right? Right? So now I've seen all these flowers and it's, where did they all come from? But a group of ladies headed by Sister James, they worked tirelessly yesterday, all day, right? While we were eating and slacking off, they were working, putting these together. I say a great thank you. I thank you for the, the ladies of the church and the church members who have always been there for mom. There was something sort of, we wanted mom because most of us, the, all the kids are in the United States. And we really wanted her to be with us there. But we debated over the years, back and forth, should she come and be with us or remain with you? But we thought it better for her to remain with you. Because we knew and we were confident of the care that she will get in your presence. And for that, you have not disappointed us. And for that, we are grateful. I say thank you. I thank you for the sister who cooked that wonderful oil dung. I had not had oil dung in 10 years. You don't get breadfruit in Colorado. It just get snow. So that was a great meal. Right, I'll have to do some working out after the ceremony. I just want to thank you. Mom, every time I call mom, I hope I have not missed anyone. Everyone has been so dear to us. And mom spoke about you all the time. And I'm glad that you have been able to come and be part of this celebration. Whenever I call mom, mom liked me to pray, and she wanted, because she was a woman of prayer. And before I call back Reverend Warm for the benediction, and then the funeral director will come and give us some final instructions, I'll just like to say a prayer. Father God, we thank you for those who have been such a blessing to our dear mother. I pray that you will richly bless them. Many of them have struggles of their own, but yet they put those aside to be there for her, to encourage her, to feed her, to clothe her. And for that, we are grateful. I pray, O oh God, that you will give them a special blessing and let them know, oh Father, O oh God, that we as the children, the grandchildren, the great grand. We will be eternally grateful. Lord, I just pray for this entire group. I pray a blessing upon them. I pray that you will encourage them in these very difficult times. As we continue in the proceedings, I pray that you will continue to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Wong. As we get ready to leave, uh, we just want to say a quick prayer for the uh, immediate family of our uh, departed sister. So we want to ask all the uh, children and grandchildren, uh, please just to stand as we pray for you. And uh, after which we would like, please, the, on the way out for the recession, we'd like to ask, please, all, everybody to remain uh, in their seats because we want the family of uh, the uh, sister Alexander please to go out following the coffin and uh, we also expect that uh, we we'll allow the minister minister Gregory Bowen we do that honorable thing too so we want us please just to be very understanding father we want to thank you in a very special way for the life and ministry of this wonderful lady of God, Sister Violet Alexander, who lived a full life, a life committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, deposited into the lives of so many goodwill, blessings, and uh, Lord, 
lived by example and also taught her children the importance of serving the Lord and they could do the same teach their children the importance of serving the Lord it is a time of grief and a time of mourning a very difficult period and we understand Lord that very often time has to elapse so that grief could be dealt with but during this period may you give them peace and give them strength and uh, they would continue to be reminded that uh, sister alexander has gone to meet her creator is with her lord strengthen them do everything for them that is deemed necessary for the best life that they can live on this earth we ask in Jesus name amen we officially did the pronouncement in fact I brought it to my church and we have have it there we've been using it at Palm Rose for the last 20 years and I know that uh, St. Paul's also use as you the benediction so we ask anybody everybody to stand and we'd like you just to raise your right hand Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Okay, if you could um, just uh, one second, I'd just like to make an announcement. For those who um, uh, have any difficulty in walking to the cemetery and you do not have a transportation, we have um, some transportation provided for you. Just for those who really cannot make it, right? Not for the young ones uh, in their midst. And one of the things I, I knew, I, I will miss someone, right? And how can I miss Eunice? And the, and, the, and the Batiste family, okay? I see um, oh, Jennifer is here with us. You, of course, Eunice is here. And, um, and the Ian and the, all of the, the hours. I, I mean, these, every time I call, Eunice is there. So she was just there for mom. And again, I would like to say thank you. Amen. She was, she was the nurse on call <laughs> 24 hours <laughs> thank you Eunice you were great amen so we're going to do our recessional hymn now and it's when we all get to heaven so everybody can join in as we sing Yeah. 
so that, and I, I always kept wondering where he was, I'd ne and I never knew. They are good players, boy. They should be everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, more than it. Yeah, 
on top there, boy. Put him on top of Okay, everybody, good afternoon. Those of you who are not at the church, but are here today at the cemetery, we want to thank you so much for showing your love. And we want to encourage you, of course, to be as supportive as possible to the families who have lost such a, a wonderful person. I read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What am I saying, dear brethren, is that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These perishable bodies of ours are not able to live forever. But let me tell you a wonderful secret God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die, but we all will be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trump is blown. For when the trump songs, the Christians who have died, will be raised with transformed bodies. And then we who are living will be transformed so that we will never die. For our perishable earthly bodies 
must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. When this happens, when our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die, then at last the scriptures will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the Lord, the Lord gives sin its power. How we thank God who gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brethren, be strong, steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is useless. And we know that whatever our the late sister did was not in vain. And all of us can stand and testify, indeed, she was a great woman. A great woman of God is not necessarily a preacher or prophetess. Anyone who is desirable of serving God and lives a fulfilled life, doing what God instructed, that's a great woman or a great man of God. And today we put her body into the ground, as the Bible tells us, that mortal must put on immortality, and that flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of God. But this body will be glorified and will turn out to be immortal. And whether we remain, as Paul says, alive when he comes, or whether indeed he comes when we, we are in the grave, the Bible tells us that the trump of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. So in as much as the Lord thought it fitting to take away his daughter to be with him, we now commit her physical body to the grave. Could we begin to lower the body, please? Grass, look grass. Some grass. Grass. Some grass. Singing, please. When the trumpets of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks its hand, and bright and fair, when the saints of the church shall gather over all the other shore, and the holy son of yonder be there, when the
Thank you so much for coming out and to show your support uh, for the family. May the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you and God bless the family and be strong. Thank you. Amen. Thank you.